Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing, we were discussing about the different properties of the enzyme in the course Enzyme Science and Technology. So in this context, in this particular module, we are discussing about the enzyme production and if you recall in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the different approaches uh, what one can go for to identify and isolate the gene responsible for a particular enzyme. So in this context, in the previous lecture, we have discussed about the uh, approach which is related to the uh, condition when the gene sequence is not known, right? which means uh, these are the conditions when the pre-genomic era, the people were only knowing the property of the enzyme, but they were not uh, very sure about the uh, what is the gene sequence and in that case uh, either you will have the information about the genome of that particular organism or you will actually going to have the expression of that particular gene. So in the previous lecture we discussed about the uh, how you can be able to identify the gene if the genome is known. So in that context what you have to do is you have to prepare a genomic library and genomic library is going to be a combination or the collection of the genes which are going to be cloned into the individual clone and uh, it is going to represent the complete genome which means the genomic library is also going to represent the cDNA library as well. Okay? Whereas if the protein or the you know that the protein is getting expressed and you have actually some tools which are uh, you know going to be tell you that okay there is a uh, you know expression construct or you have the uh, antibodies or something right and you want to screen these uh, you know the expression clones then you have to prep then you have to isolate the transcriptomes uh, and in that case what you have to do is you have to first isolate the messenger RNA and then from the messenger RNA you have to prepare this cDNA and that cDNA you have to clone into the suitable vector and uh, that is actually going to give you the uh, cDNA library and once you have the cDNA library, you can be able to use that for identifying the clone of your interest. So uh, in today's lecture, we are going to discuss about the how you can be able to prepare the cDNA library and then how whether it is the genomic library or whether it is cDNA library, how you are going to screen the clones for identifying the clone of your interest and how you can be able to then isolate the, uh, the particular fragment so that you can be able to clone that into the expression vector and that is how you can be able to produce the protein in the large quantity. So the construction of the genomic library, construction of the genomic library is a multi-step process where you are in the step 1 you are going to do the isolation of the messenger RNA. In the step 2, you are going to prepare the complementary DNA or cDNA in short and then in the step 3, you are going to clone that into a suitable vector system and in the step 4, you are going to transform that into the suitable host so that you can be able to prepare the cDNA library. Okay? So cDNA library is a, combine, is a collection of the clones which are going to show you the expression status of that particular cell. So first thing what you have to do is you have to first break open the cells, you have to isolate the uh, messenger RNAs, right? So you have to isolate the messenger RNA and uh, the step 2, uh, you so first you are going to break open the cells, you are going to get the cell lysate 
and from the cell lysate you are going to isolate the messenger RNA and we are going to discuss how you are going to do the messenger RNA and once you have the messenger RNA uh, from the cell, so these are the total messenger RNA and then you are going to use these messenger RNA and with the help of the enzyme reverse transcriptase you will be able to synthesize the DNA which is called as cDNA, cDNA means complementary DNA right. So complementary DNA to all the messenger RNA what you have isolated and then once you have the complementary DNA then you can insert that into the bacterial plasmids or other suitable uh, vectors. So that is actually going to give you the different clones and then these uh, clones are actually going to transform into the suitable host and that is how you are going to get the cDNA library. From the cDNA library you are actually going to isolate the clones of your interest and that is how you are going to identify the DNA sequence and then you can be able to use that for subcloning that into the expression vector and that is how you are going to use that for protein production or the enzyme production. So before getting into the step number 1 where we are going to talk about the isolation of the messenger RNA we have to first understand the structure of the messenger RNA because that is actually going to lead to the uh, approaches what you can actually be able to use to isolate the total messenger RNA. So if you see the structure of the messenger RNA, so in the structure of the messenger RNA you have a 5 prime cap okay, which is actually the uh, uh, 5 prime cap then you have the 5 prime uh, UTRs, then you have the coding sequence. So this is the coding sequence which is actually going to be responsible for production of the uh, protein because this is the region which is going to be translated by the ribosomal machinery. And then you have the 3 prime UTR, so 5 prime UTR and the 3 prime UTRs are the regulatory region. And up after this you are actually going to do the post translational modification. So one of the classical post translational modification is that you are going to add the poly A tail. And this poly A tail is present in all the messenger RNA. The their length could be different. Uh, some of the having the 200 messenger uh, A's, some can be having the 50 and so on. The amount of the A's what are going to be present on the 3 prime end of the messenger RNA is going to decide the age or the age of the messenger RNA or the durability of this messenger RNA. This means it is actually going to decide the stability of this messenger RNA in the uh, cytosol. Now this is the region which actually one can use to uh, identify and purify the messenger RNA. So what you can do is you can actually be able to design an affinity column and that affinity column is actually going to have a very high affinity for a poly A tail and that is how you can be able to use that to isolate the all the messenger RNA what is present in the cytosol. So these are the different steps what you are going to follow for the isolation of the messenger RNA. So this is the step 1 in the, in the construction of the uh, cDNA library. Okay. So first you have to isolate the messenger RNA. So exploiting the structure of the messenger RNA you can actually be able to use the poly A tail and the poly A tail has a very high affinity for a poly T uh, uh, columns okay? because the A is having a very high affinity for T and A is having the complementary uh, to the T and that is why you can use a poly T column and that poly T column is actually going to give you the uh, all the messenger RNA which having the poly A tail. So what you are going to do is you are going to first culture the cells and then you are going to take those culture cells and you are going to do the lysis and put, put it into the lysis buffer. If you are going to work with the tissue, for example, if you are going to work with the liver or spleen, then in that case first you have to do the homogenization and the homogenization is actually going to break open the cells to a, a single cell suspension and the single suspension is then going to be incubated with the lysis or the binding buffer and that is actually going to give you the lysis cells. Lysis cells means you are going to get the cell lysate and the cell lysate is going to have the two things. One is you, it is going to have the messenger RNA, it is going to have the protein and it also going to have the other, other RNA species. 
but as we said that the messenger RNA is actually having the poly A tail so it is actually going to bind to the column. So what you are going to do is you are going to take the beads which are actually having the poly T uh, linkers. So in the in this kind of beads what you have is you have a bead and on this bead uh, you have a linker on which you are actually going to have the T amino uh, T uh, nucleotides which are attached. So these all these T nucleotides are actually going to have the affinity for a poly A uh, tail what is present on the messenger RNA and that is how it is very specifically going to bind all the messenger RNAs what is present in the uh, cell lysate. So once it is by you are it once the binding step is over then you can wash the beads with a washing buffer and uh, you can just discard the supernatant and you can collect the beads okay and then you are going to do the elution. So what you are going to do is you are going to do the elution with the help of the uh, either the poly A um, you know poly A sequences or uh, you can change the pH and other things okay. So uh, once you do the elution you are going to have the two fractions you are going to have the bead fractions and you are going to have the supernatant fraction. This bead fraction is actually going to contain no messenger RNA because the messenger RNA is already been eluted. So they are actually going to be present in the supernatant and that you can actually be able to collect into the new tube and that actually is going to give you the all the messenger RNA which are actually going to have the poly A tail. So most of the messenger RNA are actually going to have the poly A tail. So now you have isolated the messenger RNA uh, total messenger RNA from the cell and you are going to use that for synthesis of the cDNA library or cDNA uh, of these messenger RNA which means you are going to synthesize the complementary DNA. So in the step 2 you are going to uh, synthesize the complementary DNA synthesis. So complementary DNA synthesis is a three step process in the step uh, one you first you are going to synthesize the first strand with the help of the reverse transcriptase. Then in the step two you are going to remove the RNA template and then in the uh, third step you are going to synthesize the second thread which means first you have the messenger RNA right uh, poly A tail right. So you are going to use that and you are going to put the transcript uh, reverse transcriptase reactions and uh, so you are going to put the reverse transcript reaction and that is how it is going to give you the uh, two strands. So this is going to be the RNA, this is going to be the DNA. So it is actually going to give you the DNA which is complementary to this and then you are actually going to catalyze the reaction so that it is actually uh, RNA is going to uh, degrade. So you are going to do the RNA degradation by many type of reactions and that is how you are going to have the RNA. It is only the DNA strand 1. And now using this DNA strand 1 you are going to put it for the polymerization reaction and the polymerization reaction is going to give you the two strands. So this is going to be the strand 1 and this is going to be the strand 2 and this is what is called as complementary DNA and this complementary DNA then can be cloned into a suitable vector and that is how you are going to get the cDNA library. Uh, so let us first discuss about how you are going to synthesize the complementary DNA. So we have multiple approaches what one can use to uh, perform the cDNA synthesis. So in the uh, method 1 you can use the homopolymer tailing method. In a homopolymer tailing method what you have is you have this is the messenger RNA what you have and what you can do is you can just put the oligo uh, primers. So what will happen is when you put the oligo DT primers they will come and sit next to the uh, poly A tail okay. So they will sit on the poly A tail and then you can actually be able to use the reverse transcriptase and the reverse transcriptase is actually going to synthesize the uh, first strand okay. So you are going to have the reverse transcriptase and you will going to add the four nucleotides and uh, all the four nucleotides and the, this is going to work as a primer. And that is how you are going to have the synthesis of the first strand. So this is the first strand synthesis. Once this is done then you can actually be able to get the this right and then you are going to perform the alkaline sucrose gradient. When you do the alkaline sucrose gradient it is actually going to hydrolyze the RNA and it is actually going to give you the first strand the cDNA synthesis. And then what you are going to do is you are going to add the uh, then you are going to add the oligo, oligo 
uh, G column, right? So you're going to add the oligo G column, oligo DG columns, and uh, you're also going to add the reverse transcriptase and as well as all the four DNTPs. And that's how what is happen is that it is actually going to the CCC on which is present on the first strand. And that's how it is actually going to start the synthesis of the second strand. And that's how you're going to get the duplex cDNA uh, from the uh, messenger RNA. And that you can actually be able to insert into the vector by using the suitable uh, restriction enzymes or you can actually be able to use this uh, poly T and the poly C sequences as well. So you have two choices here, either you can use the linkers or you can use the restriction enzymes. So in the poly homopolymer tailing, this method exploits the presence of poly A tail present on the messenger RNA to synthesize the first strand followed by the degradation of the messenger RNA template and the synthesis of second strand. So it has the following step. In the step one, uh, oligonucleotide DT primer is used with messenger RNA as a template to prepare the first strand of DNA with the help of the reverse transcriptase and the DNTPs. Uh, once the first strand synthesis is over, you can actually be able to do the uh, uh, terminal transferase is used. Then, then the terminal transferase is used to add the uh, uh, C nucleotide on the 3 prime of both the messenger RNA and as well as the newly synthesized uh, strand of the DNA. So uh, after this, you are going to add the, uh, you are going to add, run the uh, you know terminal transferase uh, uh, enzyme and that is actually going to add the CCC on both the messenger RNA and as well as the, the uh, cDNA, right? And then this DNA RNA hybrid is loaded onto a alkaline sucrose gradient. So alkaline sucrose gradient is actually going to contain the NaOH and, uh, and it is going to have the sucrose gradient, okay? So what will happen is when you are going to load this RNA DNA hybrid onto a su alkaline sucrose gradient, so when you load this, okay? and it actually contains the NaOH. So NaOH is actually going to degrade the RNA because it is actually going to act onto the 2 prime of hydroxyl and that is how it is actually going to form a cyclized product and that is how it is actually going to degrade the RNA. Whereas DNA does not contain the 2 prime hydroxyl and that is how it is not resist, uh, susceptible for the uh, alkaline lysis. So uh, once you do the alkaline lysis and you are going to load this complex onto the sucrose gradient, the RNA is going to be degraded and the DNA, the first strand of the DNA is actually going to be, uh, can be isolated after the gradient. So this step will hydrolyze the RNA and it will allow the full recovery of the cDNA. Once you got the first strand of the cDNA, then you actually can use uh, oligo DG primer and you can use the cDNA as a template to prepare the second strand of DNA with the help of the reverse transcriptase and the DNTPs. At this stage, the you know the second step synthesis, uh, you have the choice, you can use the reverse transcriptase and the poly G uh, primers or you can actually be able to use the uh, uh, tag DNA polymerase, you can use the RNA polymerase as well and you can actually be able to use that with the uh, DG call uh, DG uh, primers. So either of that can be work as um, and which will give you the full length uh, the cDNA, double standard cDNA uh, uh, DNA and that can further be inserted into the vector either by the homopolymer tailing or by the linkers. Then you have the step 2, the method 2, method 2 is called as the Gubber-Hoffman method. So Gubber-Hoffman method in this approach first strand synthesis uh, using oligo D primer in the presence of reverse transcriptase and the DNTPs. Then DNA-RNA hybrid is treated with the RNAs H to produce the NIC at the multiple site. Then the DNA polymerase is used to perform the DNA synthesis using the multiple fragments of RNA as a primer to synthesize the new DNA strand. This method produces the blunt and duplex DNA. So in this first step is same as the homopolymer tailing that you are going to add the poly T primers and that is actually and in the with the help of the reverse transcriptase it is actually going to give you the messenger RNA and as well as double standard RNA. So it is going to give you the messenger RNA and as well as the first strand of the DNA and now what you are going to do is you are going to add the RNAs H and you are going to add the random primers and DNA polymerase. So once you add the RNAs H, it is actually going to chew the uh, RNA at multiple places. This means it is actually going to add 
the primers uh, at multiple places. So it's going to leave some amount of RNA and it's going to keep uh, some nicks. So because of that, this uh, sequence is actually going to be used. Uh, in the second step, what you're going to do is you're going to use these sequences for uh, with the help of the DNA polymerase. So when you add the DNA polymerase to this along with the DNTPs uh, plus DNTPs, what will happen is that it is actually going to use this as a primer and that's how it is actually going to start synthesis. And you know that when the DNA polymerase will run, it is actually going to remove this particular sequence and it's going to synthesize its own sequence. And that's how it is actually going to synthesize the new DNA strand. So there will be no RNA present, okay? And the same is true for this one also, okay? And that's how you are going to get the duplex cDNA and this duplex cDNA then can further be ligated or inserted into the vector either by the, uh, with the help of the uh, linkers or the adapter proteins. So this is all about that how you are actually going to prepare the genomic, genomic library or the cDNA library. And uh, once you prepare the genomic library and cDNA library, you are going to get the number of clones, right? And then the next task is that you are actually going to do the screening of these clones with the help of the different types of analytical tools. Uh, these tools can vary and depends on the what kind of uh, diagnostic probe you have. So for example, if you have a gene fragment, right, if you have a fragment of the DNA, which is known that it is actually going to give you the that particular enzyme or suppose you have a, a antibody or suppose you have some kind of activity which is actually be associated with the unidentified enzyme X, then all these things can be used for screening, okay? So in the screening, you have three options. Either you can use as DNA probe and you can actually be able to use that for uh, screening the clones or you can actually have the antibodies you have uh, antibody which is recognizing a particular enzyme or you can actually have the enzyme activity. Uh, so either of these three methods can be used. So, say, so if you have the enzyme activity, you can actually be able to use that also to identify the clone of your interest. So let's discuss about the screening of the genomic library or the cDNA library and what are the different approaches you can use. So as I said, you know, you can have the two, three choices, either you can use the DNA sequence. So this property can be used to search both the genomic library and as well as the cDNA library to identify the gene or the clone of your interest. Uh, then we have the uh, approach number two, the expression of a particular protein with the immunogenic epitope, right? So this property can be partially useful to screen genomic library due to the truncation of a full gene or no expression of a gene fragment, but this approach well suits to the CDN library. So if you have a antibody which recognizes the uh, with the protein of interest or the enzyme of your interest, right? Uh, for example, if you know that in a particular pathological conditions, this particular antibody is being produced in the uh, patient, right? So you want to identify, if you want to identify the enzyme, what you can do is you can take this antibody and you can prepare a genomic library or the cDNA library and then you can use that as a probe to identify the clone. In this approach, uh, the cDNA library is more suitable because cDNA library means you are actually going to have the expression clones, okay? So in the expression clones, uh, the clones are actually going to start, suppose this is the clone and this is the gene what you have inserted, right? This is the messenger RNA, the cDNA it is actually going to produce the protein, okay? And this protein is then can be detected with the help of the antibody. Whereas in the case of genomic library, uh, the problem is that genomic library sometimes may have the truncated proteins, right? So sometimes it may have half protein and the half gene may be of the other. So in that case, it may actually give you the protein and that, that time you can be able to use, uh, but if it doesn't, if it only gives you a truncated protein, for example, if it only gives you a half protein and that half protein does not contain the antigenic site, then in that case, uh, it is actually going, not going to work. So 100% if you have the antibody, which is going to use as a tool to recognize the enzyme, you can be able to use the cDNA library. But uh, for the other case, like the genomic library, the DNA is 
more suitable. Then we have the enzymatic activity. For example, if you are trying to explore an enzyme which is associated with a particular activity, but you don't know the gene. In that approach, uh, the you can actually we will use the enzymatic activity. So this property exploits the ability of a protein fragment to exhibit enzymatic activity. It is useful for the screening of cDNA library, but it is not useful for the genomic library because of the simple reason that the genomic library may or may not be complete, right? Um, so the gene frag if the gene fragments are not complete. They may give you the truncated proteins and those truncated proteins may or may not give you the activity. So let's start the first method. The first method is where you are going to use the DNA sequence or DNA probe uh, for screening the clones and that can be used for both for genomic library and as well as for the cDNA library. So DNA, if you see the structure of a DNA, DNA has the double helical structure, right? Where you have the nucleotides, what is present inside the, uh, the helix, right? And these nucleotides have the very peculiar, um, uh, the peculiar base pairing, right? You always know that the adenine is always making a pair with thymine and whereas the guanine is always making a pair with cytosine. So, uh, because they are very strict and uh, they are also only paying, making a pair, right? you can actually be able to use that as a sequence. So, wherever you have the A, you are going to have the T on the template. Wherever you have the G on the probe, it is actually going to have the C on the template. So, suppose I have a template uh, DNA or if I have the uh, genomic sequence, okay, which I want to screen. Then what I'll do is I'll prepare a probe. Like for example, I have prepared a probe like this. Okay, so this is the probe I have prepared, right? So because this is the sequence, I know that it is actually going to bind to that particular gene, which is responsible for the production of this particular design. So now when it is actually going to recognize, it is actually going to recognize a protein or the DNA. What will what DNA sequence it is going to identify? it is actually going to identify a DNA sequence of this. So wherever it will find a DNA sequence with this, it is actually go and bind, okay? And that's how you can be able to identify this template DNA or this uh, cDNA clone or the clone DNA with the help of the probe. So this is going to be the probe, this is going to be this. and the probe will where the probe is binding for that you have to put a uh, some kind of uh, you know the uh, tag actually so you can actually be able to put the fluorescent tag or you can actually be able to put the radioactive tags okay so if you add the radioactive probe which has this sequence it will go and bind to all the dna sequences or the gene sequences where you have the this particular sequence present now, how you're going to do this? Uh, you're going to use this uh, with the help of the uh, from C cDNA library. So this is suppose this is the cDNA. Uh, this is the library, whether it is the genomic library or cDNA library. So you're going to have the main plate or the plate where you're going to have all the clones, and that plate is called as the master plate, which means this is the original plate where the your clones are present okay so imagine that these are the clones you have so then first in the step one what you are going to do is you are going to first transfer the master plate and you are going to prepare a replica plate so that you can actually be able to work with all the clones without destroying the master plate without destroying the original clones so you are first going to prepare a replica plate so you are going to just insert uh, invert this onto another plate and that's how it is actually going to give you the uh, replica plate or you can actually be able to transfer that onto a nitrocellulose membrane and that's how it is actually going to give you a impression of the clones onto the uh, onto the nitrocellulose membrane now in the step 2 uh, you are going to do the lysis of these cells so once you lyse the cells, uh, it is actually going to denature the DNA and it will actually going to bind the matrix, which means all the clones are, all these are, you know, cells, right? So they will be get lysed and that's how the DNA will come out, right? So DNA will come out from these cells 
but they will not going to wash away because they will go and bind to this nitrocellulose membrane. Now what you are going to do is in the step 3 you are going to add the DNA probe which actually has the uh, tag. So either it can have the radioactive tag or is a fluorescent tag. So once the tag is there it will actually go and bind to its specific uh, you know for example if it is binding to this particular clone and uh, then what you can do is you can just take this uh, replica plate or you can take this replica membrane and then you can actually compare that with the help of the master plate and you will know that this is the clone what is response or which is the where the gene of my interest is present okay and then you, what you can do is you can just take out this uh, gene of interest and you can just grow them into the uh, into the uh, into the media and that is how you can be able to isolate the plasmid or you can actually isolate the recombinant DNA and from this plasmid you can be able to isolate the gene of your interest and that is how you can use this gene for further downstream uh, applications. So it has the uh, following steps okay. The step 1 you are going to prepare a suitable radioactive probe, you can prepare also the fluorescent probe. Then you are going to prepare a replica plate. So this is what the replica plate. Then you are going to transfer of the colonies on the nitrocellulose membrane. Then you hybridize that with a specific probe which means the radioactive probe. And then you are going to wash and development of the membrane by the audio radiography and that is actually going to tell you on which probe it is actually what on which colony it is binding. And that is how you can actually go back to the master plate and you can actually identify. Now how you are going to prepare the radioactive probes, so you can actually be able to use the multiple methods of preparing the radioactive probes. So in the preparation of the radioactive probes, you can use the random primer method. So in the random primer methods, uh, in this method a uh, random primer is used to anneal to the template and then a PCR reaction is performed in the presence of the radio labeled nucleotide. After the PCR, the newly synthesized DNA strand is labeled with a radioactive nucleotide. So what you are going to do is suppose this is the template which for which you want to synthesize the probe. So what you are going to do is you are going to add the oligonucleotide primers and you will do the hybridization. So it will actually go and hybridize and then what you are going to do is you are going to do a DNA synthesis with the help of the clino fragments and the four DNTPs. So it will actually going to synthesize the strands and that is how it is actually going to incorporate the radioactive uh, nucleotides and that is how it is actually going to produce the, the labeled probe and that labeled probe you can actually be able to purify with the help of the gel filtration chromatography and that can be used for further downstream applications. Then we also have the uh, terminal transferase method. So we also have the terminal transferase method. So in the terminal transferase method you are going to use an enzyme which is called as terminal transferase. So in this method a terminal transferase enzyme will label the probe at the end of the last nucleotide of the probe. Probe is incubated with the labeled nucleotide and the terminal transferase enzyme and will add the labeled nucleotide at the end. A partial purification of the gel filtration column will give you the labeled probe. So for example this is the gene okay. So what you are going to do is first you are going to treat it with the alpha endonuclease and that is actually going to cause the NICS. And then you are going to have the terminal transferase and as well as the radioactive DATPs. For example, if you want, if I want to, uh, you know, radio labeled the ATP, right? So what will happen is it is actually going to add the A's on uh, one end, okay? And that's how it is actually going to incorporate the radio radioactivity in both the strands of this particular gene. And that's how I am going to get the radioactive probe with one end of the probe as radioactive and that I can further purify with the help of the gel filtration chromatography. And now once the uh, probe is ready I can use that for the screening purpose. So for the screening purpose I have to prepare the replica plate. So as the original genomic DNA or cDNA library is precious and will be consuming in the later stage all procedure is performed with the replica plate containing the colonies in a identical manner. First you are going to transfer, so the clone is transferred onto a nitrocellulose membrane with retaining the identical pattern of the colonies on the master plate. The cells on the membranes are lysed and the released DNA is denatured, deprotonated and allowed to bind to the membrane. 
So this step is very crucial and it actually going to uh, decide what will be the success of your screening because if you could be able to do this successfully then you what you are going to do is you are going to actually lyse the cells and the DNA is actually going to immobilize to the site of that particular clone. Uh, then you are going to do the hybridization. So a label probe prepared in step 1 will actually going to be added. The probe will add to the target DNA to, to the base pairing. The membrane is washed to remove the unbound and then you are going to do the development of autoradiogram. So this position of the radio label is detected by the autoradiogram. The position of the signal on the membrane can be washed with the master plate to get the location. For example, if this is the plate, right? and this is my master plate so i will actually superimpose both of them and then i will know that okay this is the clone which actually is giving the uh, signal or the radiogram so then i can actually be able to isolate this and i can isolate the gene of interest now the second step second method so second method is the screening by the immunological method so in the immunological method you are going to use the antibody as the uh, probe right so uh, antibodies uh, can be tagged with the enzyme or you can actually be able to add the fluorescent. So antibody can be tagged to the fluorescent dye or it can be attacked to the uh, enzyme such as HRP or uh, alkaline phosphatase. So in this case so what you are going to do is step 1 is same. You are actually going to prepare first the master plate and then you are going to prepare the replica plate and from the replica plate you are going to transfer the uh, cells and onto the membrane and that's how you're going to prepare the netocellulose membrane and then you're going to lyse the cells and allow the protein to bind to that site and uh, once that is done then you are going to add the primary antibodies and once you add the primary antibody the primary antibody is actually will go and bind to the sites wherever you have the antigen of interest you treat the matrix with the primary antibody and the primary antibody is actually going to uh, you know bind and bind the proteins what is present within the cell and uh, that's how you actually going to give you and then what you're going to do is you're going to add the secondary antibodies so secondary antibody is actually going to be tagged with the uh, enzyme or the fluorescence right so that secondary antibody will go and bind to the primary antibody and wherever it will bind it is actually going to give you a signal so looking at the signal right for example this this is the clone which is giving you the signal you can go back to the original plate so original plate is saying that this is the clone from where i am getting the signal so in that case you actually can use that and you can isolate that clone and you can actually be able to grow that into the large quantities and that's how you can actually be able to isolate the plasmids and the, from the plasmid you can be able to isolate the gene and that gene you can actually be able to use for the overexpression purpose. So uh, these are the two methods which are very very which are very very popular either the immunological method where you are going to use the antibody as a probe or the DNA probes. Apart from that, you can also use the screening by the enzymatic enzymatic method. So this method is based on the ability of a protein to exhibit an enzymatic activity. This method is not very specific, but it allow us to identify a class of protein with the known enzymatic activity. So in this case also, you are going to have the same steps. What you are going to do is you are going to first prepare the master plate, right? So this is the master plate. So this is the master plate, uh, from the master plate you are going to prepare the uh, replica plate uh, like this, okay. And uh, this is going to be the, your replica plate and the replica plate, uh, from the replica plate you are going to first transfer that onto a nitrocellulose membrane. So you are going to prepare that onto the NC membrane and on this NC membrane you are going to add the substrate for your enzyme. So you are going to lyse the cells, right? You are going to lyse the cells and you are going to add the substrate. So once you add the substrate, it is actually going to give you the signal, okay? This signal you can actually be able to compare which is there on the replica plate to the master plate and that's how you will say that, okay, this is the clone of my interest and that's how it is actually going to give you. The only issue with the screening by the enzymatic method is that it may not be unique because in some cases you might have to see that uh, multiple clones are actually going to give you the activity because the substrate uh, a substrate is a very very 
uh, you know non specific uh, probe because substrate can be ident can be used by the multiple enzymes and that's how it may actually give, misguide you in terms of the getting the clones for example if i use the glucose as a substrate right so glucose can be used by the hexokinase uh, glucose can be used by the glucokinase glucose can be used in any other other reactions also so in that case uh, the you may get the clone of your interest but the uh, it is not very specific and uh, you may actually be able to use or you might have to use the other screening method to further verify the clones so this is all about how you can be able to screen the genomic library and as well as the cdna library and once you actually have screened and you say that okay this is the clone i have to identify isolate you can actually have to perform the multiple steps to isolate this particular clone also so how you're going to isolate the gene so once the position of a clone is known it is extracted from the master plate and the plasmid is isolated in few cases the clone is further diluted to check the homogeneity of the clone the purity of the clone and the presence of clone is further tested with the pcr using the site sequence specific primers so what happen is that you what you're going to do is you're going to first isolate the clone okay and then you are actually going to dilute that into 1 is to 10 or 1 is to 100 dilutions okay and then again you are going to plate that onto a plate okay so in that case you are going to get all the colonies okay ideally if this clone is pure which means it only has the single gene uh, it actually will all these clones are identical to each other so again if you repeat the probing reactions like either you use the dna probe or antibody probe or the enzymatic method all these clones should actually give you the signal which means all these clones should give you the signal because if it, it could also happen that some of the clones actually will give you the signal okay in those cases what happen is in that case the this particular clone is not pure it may have actually the multiple clones which are coming together or when you were isolating the clone the, you actually got the cross contamination from the neighboring clones also so in that case you have to first do the uh, you know the this is the primary screening through which you got this clone then you might have to do the secondary screening by further diluting these clones and uh, doing the same reaction again and again and you have to repeat that until you are actually getting all the clones which are actually going to give you the signal so that is what you have to do uh, if you want to isolate the gene so once you got this you can actually be able to isolate the plasmid and that plasmid is actually going to contain the gene of your interest so that you can actually be able to use the gene and then you can actually be able to use the pcr and you can actually be get the amplified gene and that amplified gene you can put into the expression clones or expression vector and that's how you can be able to use that for uh, protein production so this is what we have discussed so we have discussed about the approach one where which is very very common or very very much popular into the pre-genomic era when the genomic sequence were not known and you were only knowing that the, there is an antibody which has been found in the and patient or there is a genomic sequence or the DNA fragments is found and something like that. So in those cases, you have to use the genomic library. So you have to take the genome, you have to prepare the genomic library, or you might have to isolate the messenger RNA and you have to prepare the cDNA library. And then once you are, you prepare the genomic library or the cDNA library, you can use that for screening the clone of your interest with the help of either the DNA probe or the antibodies or the enzymatic method. Once uh, utilizing these three screening tools, you can be able to screen the clone of your interest. And once you got the clone of interest, you can just isolate the plasmid, you can prepare the, you can isolate the gene of your interest, you can use the PCR to amplify the gene of your interest and then you can actually clone it into the suitable uh, expression vector and that's how you are going to get the uh, that particular uh, gene responsible for the uh, production of the enzyme into a expression vector and that's how you can be able to use that for uh, enzyme production so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about the second approach where the gene sequence is known and that is very common and very popular nowadays to, for the uh, enzyme production. 
So with this, I would like to conclude my lecture here. Thank you.